The Danakil Depression is one of two locations in the world where flooding an inland sea is cost effective and can produce a large enough impact on the water energy nexus to make the overall process of green energy highly cost competitive with the burning of hydro hydrocarbons or fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels to power desalinization plants along coasts is not very efficient. In both examples depicted in this video, Mother Nature's own blow dryer is set on extreme high with very hot dry winds blowing across the surface area of each sea. On Earth, incoming solar radiation produces essentially a global circulation system including Hadley cells and Farrell cells which tend to concentrate hot dry winds in specific locations. Both projects discussed exist in regions where hot dry winds are concentrated. Weather, climate, and monsoons are complex subjects that depend on many forcings. Wind currents above the Danakil Basin for three quarters of the year are dominated by westerly winds blowing off the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Power density maps for wind energy have been created for about every place in the world. This location here is of particular interest for the Danakil Basin. The wind direction for this particular resource comes from the east in the Arabian Peninsula and blows directly into the heart of the continent. Geology and topography play a huge role in what happens to these winds blowing off of Saudi Arabia. Essentially, they blow straight across and over the low-lying marine boundary layer above the Red Sea and are tripped by a small mountain range on the thinned crust region shown here and fall into the Danakil Basin where they heat up a link to weather spark is provided in this transmittal. The winds and weather and climate in Mekili provide us with a means to illustrate what's going on with the monsoon in Africa and weather in a particularly dry portion of the Ethiopian plateau. Essentially, there are many stations uh, located along this area and Makili is in the lowest area of a mountain range that extends from north to south. The rainy season in Makili lasts from, let's say, June through September and is primarily dependent on South Atlantic moisture a continent away to the west. It's the wind speed and direction at Maliki and other local stations that's a primary concern here. Most of the year it comes from the east. That's the area shown in green. Erosion patterns in the local Simeon Mountains depict a far wetter past than what present day currently shows. Some areas are wet, some areas are dry. This looks like the Grand Canyon. I've been asked to produce some demonstration of concept information. So let's travel halfway around the world and look at Laguna Salada, which was recently flooded uh, back in 1984 and some time frames between then and now. I've included a free link to Google Earth Pro where you can download load the program but if you get on and click the clock at the top you can click through time and watch Laguna Salada fill and then evaporate away. Here is 1984 and here is 2019. Draining or filling this lake actually produces a very large result in Colorado River flows. The flashing blue line is the existing Coyote Canal that used to take irrigation runoff from Mexicali and bring it into Laguna Salada. Today it's partially flooding with high tide ocean water from the northern gulf. Now this isn't just from sea level rise, there's another number of other factors including the 2010 earthquake, subsidence, other things. But it has been filled before by agricultural water producing a fishery. And this gives us a time frame starting in 1980 when it really started to get flooded. It actually produced a evaporative rate of 2,420 millimeters per year or 2.4 meters per year. That's huge.
To put this in perspective, Laguna Salada evaporates almost 8 feet per year per unit area. The Salton Sea evaporates almost 6 feet per year. The Dead Sea, only 4 to 5 feet per year. Colorado River stream flow data from the USGS allows us the opportunity to compare flooded area in Laguna Salada, Mexicali, and the Northern Gulf with stream flows from roughly 1980 to the year 2000. As part of the proof of concept, I'll provide you with the tools to analyze why surface area in Laguna Salada has a real strong correlation between the spikes in this time frame. I've also included a link to a free psychrometic calculator. The free version only allows you to change uh, temperature and humidity. The density of liquid water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. The specific volume of liquid water is one over that, or said another way, uh, there's 1,000 liters of water in a cubic meter. A liter weighs one kilogram. One kilogram occupies one one thousandth of a cubic meter. One consequence of this information is that when liquid water turns to vapor in this environment, it expands 25,000 times. Simply divide 25 meters cubed per kilogram by 0 0.001 meters cubed per kilogram to get this number. When water vapor condenses into precipitable moisture at the base of a cloud, the inverse is true. Have you ever wondered why winds are so strong around thunderstorms? Another important property of moist air uh, that leads to convection is that it is always less dense under any temperature than dry air. That's why humidity tends to rise and form clouds. Buoyancy of air is a big factor in calculating convective available potential energy. That's the buoyancy, that's what pushes through things like inversion layers. This is a good diagram of the existing model for a dry Laguna Salada. This paper was produced after Laguna Salada had dried out. Here, essentially, hot, dry desert winds come in and form a plug, an inversion layer that stops the near-saturated marine boundary layer that exists above the northern gulf from propagating northward. Flooding Laguna Salada basically blows up this side of the model. So if hot, dry westerly winds off of Laguna Salada are replaced with hot, wet winds, it blows up the model and free convection occurs. I promise the last property of the psychrometic calculator uh, that we'll use looks at the mixing ratio of water vapor to dry air for 100% humidity. It may be surprising to many of you that water vapor only comprises about 3.7% of total air mass at 100% humidity in warm air. This last property allows us to calculate some basic things, like the volume of a marine layer above Laguna Salada. Um, you're looking at about 250 cubic kilometers of supersaturated airspace 305 meters deep over 820 square kilometers. An issue with this is that 2.4 meters per year evaporates from the surface area. In order to sustain this rate of evaporation, it's necessary to create 5.71 cubic kilometers per hour of pure water vapor. Dividing this by the mixing ratio of 0 0.0372 means that you create a fully saturated air mass of 153 cubic kilometers of humid, fully humid, saturated air per hour. If this air mass were to sit over Laguna Salada, evaporation from Laguna Salada would cease. With strong westerly winds in place, that means that most of this moisture gets blown over to Mexicali and blows up the model. The power and energy required to evaporate nearly 2 trillion liters of water per year, or 62,925 kilograms per second, is massive. 
multiplying kilograms per second by the latent heat of water vaporization provides a massive amount of energy, 142 gigawatts of energy that not only desalinates the water, but transports it uphill where it falls as rain and goes in behind hydroelectric plants. So at Laguna Salada and Danakil, how much energy, buoyancy that we pump into the atmosphere has a direct impact on how much downwind precipitation we get. A link to the most accurate methodology of predicting monsoonal rainfall and this paper uh, is included in this transmittal. And yes, I could beat you over the head with the science for another hour or two, but I'm trying to make this short, and we're talking about Danakil. So let's go back to there and see how this science relates to that. One of many options at the Danakil Basin is to flood the basin to 100 feet or so below sea level. This would create a wetted surface area of about 1.65 million acre feet and a hydroelectric dam producing about 165 megawatts of power at 14 million acre feet per year of flow. And the existing power grid extends close to where we need it. Some extension will be required. Upgrading the grid in this area will allow us to take advantage of wind turbines and using the wind as a really inexpensive conduit for transporting water vapor. Compared to Laguna Salada, the Anacal Basin is steep and deep. 1.65 million acres of surface area with an average depth probably greater than 100 feet would mean the volume of the lake would be at least 165 million acre feet. Filling that at 14 million acre feet per year would take forever. As we fill it, the surface area gets greater, evaporation gets greater, and we have to consider this 60,000 yard long trench through mostly alluvial materials with a maximum elevation of 65 feet. The actual dam would be small relative to other hydraulic dams, but would require massive penstocks and turbines. So think doubling the flow and power uh, to 28 million acre feet a year so we could fill the sea in a reasonable amount of time. Once the sea is filled, you run the dam during peak electrical periods and not so much during not off hours. Annual flows through the dam will depend on the surface area of the flooded sea and the annual evaporation rate of that sea. Yet another control knob to consider for our mechanism is sea surface temperatures within the Red Sea itself. We'll be pulling water from the Red Sea down around this location shown in the blinking yellow. The temperature of water we choose to import makes a big difference in scales or mechanisms like this. Ambient air temperatures at the surface of a flooded Denikel Basin Sea will likely be slightly warmer than coastal uh, temperatures along the Red Sea. Taking this information into account means that we'll have some control over sea surface temperatures in our new flooded sea. So as we fill the lake, surface area goes up, evaporation goes up, salt concentration in the mid main body goes up. So creating salt evaporation ponds, possibly seawater mining areas in the natural depressions that exist all over this basin, becomes a logical solution to salt. Freshwater runoff from this large basin will follow the existing stream beds and create sufficient flow to probably create a large number of skinny dams with hydroelectric dams that will allow us to irrigate more effectively this large region in Sudan. Irrigation here will actually create evapotranspiration, which will trace essentially along the desert band, the southerly portion of it, and probably moisten the entire African continent. Personally, I question the wisdom of flooding such basins like the Katara Basin. This basin lacks a close proximity 
to mountain ranges like the Simeon Mountains or Colorado Rockies that form the Colorado River Basin and or a basin leading into the Nile River. Personally, I started my college career as an engineer, took lots of calculus and physics, and eventually dropped into finance and had a capstone in market penetration strategies. Most of my career has been in construction management, moving vast amounts of dirt, installing utilities, and building houses for hillside communities in Southern California. When I look at images like this, I see a market penetration opportunity for the green energy sector to compete with hydrocarbon-based energy production in the overall process of supplying both water and power to communities to create vibrant, productive communities. At Aegis Inc., it's our goal to use what Mother Nature gives us and to penetrate the energy water commodity market in such a way as to actually reduce the cost of these two commodities in a manner that hydrocarbons cannot compete with. Think of the efficiencies shown in this video versus burning hydrocarbons, transmission lines, and building billion dollar desalinization plants. The energy conversion rate or power of each of these facilities will be massive. Both will provide massive amounts of, of water and precipitation for vast ecosystems. I would like to ask you to consider the carbon footprint of both different types of schemes, flooding the, the seas versus burning fossil fuels to desalinate water. Here we're looking at the net total cost of providing both commodities to communities on a near continental scale. Flooding the seas will actually create a carbon sink by watering forests downwind. I thank you for your time and I look forward to your comments. This is meant to start a discussion. I look forward to talking with all of you in the near future. Thanks again.